cloud. Okay, great. So we're now recording. All right, so uh, of course, it's a pleasure to have uh, Jordi Williamson with us um, today, um, sit this morning and in other hours and other places. Um, so, of course, from University of Sydney, he is going to talk about uh, geometric extension. Thank you very much, Beruz. Uh, yeah, so I'm talking about um, this concept of geometric extension, which um, is basically a generalization of something that um, I've been working on for some time, this theory of parity sheaves. Um, but I don't expect you to know any of that. I expect you to basically know much more algebraic geometry than I do, and potentially less um, representation theory. And um, I'll basically be using constructible sheaves the whole time. And I'm expecting that, you know, perhaps you don't work with constructible sheaves every day. So, uh, and first, I just wanted to um, let you know about a conference that is coming in, I guess, not next week, but the week after, um, representation theories, hidden motives. Um, I'm really excited about this. And if you're interested, have a look. Um, so to, it's, it's kind of online and um, in-person conference. Okay, so I just wanna give you the theorem first, um, and then basically the whole talk will be explaining um, the context of this theorem and why I'm interested in it. So we, we start with an algebraic variety over C with its metric topology. And there's no particular reason um, to impose these constraints. We could also work in the Atal topology. Uh, we're very much working in the world of um, constructible sheaves. And so K is a field of coefficients and uh, the case of Q coefficients is very interesting, um, but is kind of well understood through the theory of intersection cohomology complexes. So uh, usually um, K is something like FP. Okay, so roughly speaking, um, this is a talk about the algebraic topology of algebraic varieties with mod P coefficients. So where the, where the coefficients are of mod, mod p. So here's the theorem. There exists a co constructible complex of sheaves uniquely characterized by the following condition. So basically, given any resolution of singularities, it splits off as a direct sum end. So, um, and then this notion of resolution of singularities could be rather, rather weak. It just has to be an isomorphism of some open locus. So for example, we could take x smooth here, in which case this would be the constant sheaf. And you can check that, for example, the constant sheaf, if x is smooth, splits off any proper map. So the direct image sheaf of any proper map. Okay. So that's the theorem. Uh, so this is an example of a geometric extension, what we're calling a geometric extension. Um, that's what I just said. If it's smooth, it's the constant sheaf. Um, I'm not expecting you to kind of know and familiar, be familiar with IC sheaves, but if, um, if K is Q, then E of X is IC XQ, is the intersection cohomology complex. And why are we calling the extension and what about local systems? This I'll discuss later. So now for the first kind of 20 minutes, half an hour, I just want to kind of explain the circle of ideas that, that leads you to consider these type of objects. And I also want to warn you that this is somewhat of a fairy tale. Um, I, it's a little bit of a fairy tale, but it's not, I don't think it's a bad fairy tale. So I also like fairy tales sometimes. Uh, So what we, what we have is a smooth projective variety and we want to compute, for example, its cohomology or 
let's say it's cohomology with mod p coefficients, or perhaps it's topological k-theory or some other topological invariant of x. And roughly speaking, there's two ways we can do it. We can go about this. There's the additive way where we choose some z inside x, let's say open or closed. open or closed, and then we work with long exact sequences. Um, compute, you know, compute connecting homomorphisms, basically the stuff that we do um, in a first course in algebraic topology to compute the cohomology of spaces, of the first spaces that we encounter. Um, there's also the multiplicative way where we might say, oh, perhaps X is a fiber bundle. So perhaps this is a, um, a proper smooth map. So this is the kind of algebraic geometry's um, vibration. And then we might um, consider a take a Lorentz spectral sequence, like um, consider a, and assume. So if we assume that pi one of the base is trivial, um, we can consider a Lorentz spectral sequence. Let's assume that pi one of the base is trivial. So if we assume that pi one of the base is trivial, we have a Lorentz spectral sequence from um, basically cohomology of the base tends to cohomology of the fiber. Converging to cohomology of X. And, and this is kind of what we do in the second, second course in algebraic topology. But some kind of major problem is that um, proper smooth maps are rare. in algebraic ge geometry. So in algebraic topology, we learn that the kind of fact that just blew my mind the first time I learned it, that any map is homotopic to a vibration. And so I can kind of pretend that all maps are vibrations. And in our algebraic geometry, um, I can't do that. Um, so we need to consider more general maps um, so that's just the same slide again. So we would like to apply Lorentz air type sequences, type spectral sequences for maps, for, for more general maps. And now following growth and leak, we, we compute the cohomology of X as the global sections of the constant chief. So here we take the constant chief on X with coefficients in Q and um, the cohomology of X is computed by P lower star QX in the derived category of a point. Okay. So we can compute the cohomology of X just by um, pushing forward along P to a point. And this point of view is uh, really beautiful because we can factor our map to a point so we can kind of factor the computation of, in fact, the computation of P lower star QX into two steps. So first we understand, first understand Um, F lower star of QX, then we can push this forward to a point. Okay. And, you know, you, you're probably aware that this is the source of the um, Lorentz spectral sequence, the Lorentz air spectral sequence. This is one way of deriving it. But the nice, um, the nice way of phrasing it like this is that we don't we don't no longer require f to be a um, 
the vibration. And um, I just want to remind you about constructible sheaves. So, uh, so this direct image, so this is a, um, a proper map of algebraic varieties and F lower star of QX is constructible. So we can find a, uh, a decomposition of Y. So we can find a decomposition of Y into finitely many locally closed subsets over which our map is uh, topologically locally trivial. And that implies by the proper base change theorem that our complex here will be constructible. So roughly speaking, we, so maybe it's useful for me to just recall proper base change. So if we have x, y and some point y inside here, um, we can consider, so this is a fiber, so we can consider this Cartesian diagram and proper base change tells me that F lower star QX. I should have said that, yeah, I've said it here, all functors are derived. Whenever I'm writing F lower star, I mean the derived functor of F lower star. Um, so proper base change tells me that I upper star of F lower star of QX is the same thing as I upper star of F lower shriek of QX because this is proper. And now proper base change tells me Byron that this is um, F lower shriek twiddle of I QX, which is just F lower star of the constant sheaf on F. So it's the cohomology of the fibers. So uh, this direct image sheaf has um, cohomology sheaves which measure, measure the topology of the fibers. And the fact that we can um, stratify this map says that this direct image is a constructible sheaf. So we can find a decomposition of Y. Um, yeah, so I messed up here a bit. into locally closed sub varieties such that the restriction of this sheaf to each of these sub varieties has locally constant cohomology. So a constructible sheaf is one which is built out of um, local systems on strata. Okay. And the other thing that um, I should have said is that uh, I've already um, stated the theorem, so um, you can ask as many questions as you want and I don't mind how slowly we go. Okay, but please do let me know if something is um, wildly unclear. Uh, so just as an example of this philosophy, I wanted to go over the kind of skeleton of Deline's proof of the Vey conjectures. So this is the beautiful statement that if X, so this is um, the, the Vey R, the first of Deline's papers, if we take on the Vey conjectures, we take X smooth projective over a finite field. Then the Frobenius action on the etal cohomology of X when we exchange then X to the algebraic closure is pure. So um, I want to uh, discuss this argument, um, you know, in a kind of cartoon version because it very nicely illustrates um, what I've just been trying to kind of advocate for in terms of computing cohomology. So the first step is that um, after a blow up, so we, we can blow up X and now, um, and you know, as you, probably well know the, the, the cohomology of X embeds inside the cohomology of the blow up. So it's enough to show this statement for the blow up. And then X hat 
admits to lift shit's vibration. P1. So this means this is generically smooth and the singularities of this map are um, generic. And now step two is by induction, using um, the kind of theorem for the fibers. We can deduce a kind of decomposition theorem type statement, which is that the, the direct image of the constant sheaf on X hat is a direct sum of, um, of sheaves, not complexes, or like is a direct sum of shifts of sheaves, um, which are pure of a certain weight. And then step three, which is um, where all the work is, um, show that F pure on that if F is a F is a sheaf pure of weight. Omega, then H I, a sheaf on P1, pure of weight omega, then H I P1 F is um, pure of weight omega plus I. And here there's only three potentially interesting groups, zero, one, and two, and zero and two are kind of easily dealt with. And the vast majority of the paper is showing us the statement for H1. And I don't know, I find it totally remarkable when I first read this paper that, or first tried to read this paper, is that, um, you know, you start off with a theorem about all projective varieties, but then you spend um, an enormous amount of time basically on P1. So you reduce the question about all varieties to a question about essentially about certain sheaves on P1. Um, okay. So now I just want to briefly go through IC magic. Um, so now suppose that I have a um, locally closed subvariety and I have a local system on it, then we can form the intersection cohomology complex. So this is um, in the constructible derived category. Let's say with Q coefficients or. And this intersection cohomology complex is supported on the closure of U and its restriction to the open part of you, the smooth part of you. Uh, so I should have said locally closed and smooth. <coughs> um, yeah, it's restriction to the open to the open part is just the the um, local system, and this is a shift so as to be vertiaceous self dual. So here's a picture. So imagine, so the ambient variety here is some space. And then inside, he, inside this space, I have um, something like a quadric. 
in this particular example. And then I can consider the open locus of this quadric and put a local system on it. Now, what IC magic does is extends this, whoops. It extends this um, local system to a complex supported on the closure. So in this particular case, the only kind of interesting point would be this new point here. And it, um, yeah, it somehow magically extends this complex to the closure um, in a way that I won't go into. But roughly you should think about, think that this um, IC extension is a kind of minimal possible extension. So, um, yeah, so it just as an example of this is that imagine that I have, imagine that U bar is smooth and that L extends to U bar as a local system. So even if U bar is smooth, my local system may not extend because it might have kind of monodromy around the boundary. But if it is smooth and it extends, then L bar is simply, sorry, the IC extension is simply L bar. And roughly speaking, you can, um, you can um, think about the IC extension as some kind of like crumpled extension of this local system. Like it, it wants to extend to be a local system, but it cannot. And this is the minimal way that it cannot. And um, the construction of, I see is via the theory of perverse sheaves. So basically, one has, um, if we let the inclusion of u into u bar denote by j, then we can consider j shriek of. Um, you and in the theory of perverse sheaves um so the theory of perverse sheaves gives you a remarkable abelian category inside the constructible derived category and these objects, um, once we once we kind of force them to be perverse, satisfy that their the kind of extension having no one of these has no subobjects and one of these has no quotients um, supported on the closed stratum. And then we define this as a as an image. So this is I C. So we have two objects of a canonical nature, and then I C is defined as the image of the map from one in the other. Um, and from this point of view, it's extremely difficult to compute what this IC is. So there's other points of view that make, make its computation much more, much more easy. And um, this whole theory came out of this kind of remarkable, um, remarkable events in the 70s. So on the one hand, you had Goreski and McPherson who were um, trying to write down good cohomology theories for singular spaces and we're, st we're studying kind of the allowability of certain chains in your space to intersect and then on the other hand you had um, the Russian and Japanese schools of, um, of algebraic demodules um, and there was this kind of remarkable moment at the end of the 70s where people realized that Goreski McPherson working in algebraic topology and um, people like Balinson and Bernstein working in D modules were actually studying the same theory. Um, yeah. So this is this IC magic. And the decomposition theorem says that if we have a proper map and X is smooth, then the direct image of the constant chief on X I'll always write D subscript X for the complex dimension. So this is again, just a, a shift to allow this to be self-dual is isomorphic to a direct sum of shifts of I C U bar L I um, 
M U L I, where uh, U inside Y is locally closed and smooth. Uh, L on U is an um, irreducible local system. And I is just a shift. So this is what we call semi-simple. So it's not semi-simple in any um, sense of being an object in an abelian category, but it's kind of, roughly speaking, the decomposition theorem says that when viewed in the correct way, this object breaks up as much as it possibly could. Okay. And I should say it's kind of enormously complicated to work out which sum ends occur here. For example, um, the support theorem of Ngo, which got him the Fields Medal, is basically saying that for the Hitchin vibration, um, what can show up here on a certain locus is very restricted. It's very, basically nothing unexpected shows up on a big locus of the Hitchin base. Um, so the decomposition theorem, um, so we've just, see the statement, and the fact that the coefficients are rational numbers is essential. And basically, one way of interpreting the decomposition theorem is that before I was kind of motivating the study of um, this complex as understanding the cohomology of X. And the kind of naive way that we do this is just by um, taking, just looking at the cohomology sheaves of this direct image. And what the decomposition theorem tells us is that that's the wrong way to do that. And if we filter in the sense of perverse sheaves, then the Lorais air spectral sequence degenerates, which is remarkable. Um, and there's many other remarkable aspects of the decomposition theorem. Um, I just want to give one example to illustrate its power. So this is the... Um, Goethe's Ergel computation of the cohomology of Hilbert schemes um, of smooth algebraic surfaces. So here we have a smooth surface, smooth algebraic surface, and we consider the Hilbert scheme of n points on X. And my understanding is that, um, that Goethe just became fascinated by computing the cohomology of this and then made incredibly interesting um, proved incredibly interesting theorems and made conjectures about putting all these together and things like this. But we really want, let's say that we really want to compute the, the cohomology of this Hilbert scheme. So we have this um, Hilbert Chow map. So I should say this is rather old. This is from about 1993, I think. Um, but it's a remarkable, it's always like, if you want to read one paper that illustrates the power of the decomposition theorem and is kind of comprehensible, I think this is, this is a good place to start. Um, I think the paper is about 11 pages long and you get a beautiful theorem out of it. So we consider the Hilbert scheme. We consider the Hilbert Chow map to the nth symmetric power of X, which is of course singular, but only mildly singular. And now in this particular case, when we apply the decomposition theorem and do a little bit of work, we conclude that the direct image of the, of the constant chief under the Hilbert Chow map splits up in in some sense, the, the nicest way possible. So you can imagine that there's strata here corresponding to partitions of N. So the number of points that, um, so for example, the partition one, 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 one would correspond to the open locus of distinct points here. And the partition N would correspond to um, all of your points being one point. So this gives you a stratification of, um, of this symmetric power. And also each of these strata are just, um, are just isomorphic to other symmetric powers, lower symmetric powers, where you look at the number of parts of your partition. Um, and basically the decomposition theorem kind of couldn't be nicer in this case. It says, if you take the constant sheaf up here and push it forward, you just get one IC sheaf for every one of these strata. And the other really nice thing here is that 
over Q, these IC sheaves are just constant sheaves because this just has finite quotient singularities. So this is just a constant sheaf on S alpha X with some shift. Okay, so, so this very beautifully splits up the um, the cohomology of the Hilbert scheme in terms of the cohomology of the um, these strata, and also these strata are easily computed um, as kind of some kind of symmetric group invariance inside products of the cohomology of the surface. So um, this gives you complete knowledge of the cohomology and Hodge theory of the Hilbert scheme in terms of that of X. Note that uh, one thing it doesn't give you is the multiplication, and I think um, maybe maybe I'm making this up, but I think the multiplication is still a mystery that in cohomology. Okay. Uh, so now we kind of um, get to the um, rolling up our sleeves end of the talk a little bit. But are there any talk? Are there any uh, questions based on the first half? Okay, so um, Krull-Schmidt category. Um, so Krull-Schmidt categories are additive. It's an additive category A such that every object um, is isomorphic. to a direct sum of indecomposable objects and here indecomposable has the um, potentially obvious or potentially not obvious meaning that you just can't write it as a direct sum in any way so if if your object is a plus b then one of a and b is zero that's what indecomposable means um, b an object is an object X is indecomposable if and only if the endomorphism ring of X is local. Okay. So we can tell, um, we can tell whether an object is, is um, indecomposable by looking at its endomorphism ring. And um, Krull-Schmidt implies that the Krull-Schmidt theorem holds So any X admits, so any Y can be written XI essentially uniquely. I mean, um, and the, the multi set of the XI is um, well defined. But it's definitely not equivalent to the Krull-Schmidt theorem holding. For example, if you consider Z modules, then the, the, the Krull-Schmidt theorem holds in finitely generated Z modules, but um, the endomorphism ring of Z is not local. Okay, so yeah, so that's the example that I just gave. So essentially, like. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you. For, there was a question in the chat. I didn't quite see who it was from. Um, so can be written as this with the XI in decomposable. Thank you.
Thank you, Hélène. Um, so something like um, coherent cheese on something is almost never cool Schmidt. Um, kind of, you know, most of K theory comes out of the fact that the Krull Schmidt theorem doesn't hold. Um, I mean, K theory for, for um, affine schemes. Um, but examples where it does hold is when you have very strong finiteness conditions over on, on your endomorphism rings. So an example would be a constructible derived category, basically by finiteness of cohomology. Um, vector bundles on X, if X is, X is projective. Um, there's an old paper of a TIA on vector bundles on elliptic curves, which, um, which explains this Krull-Schmidt property really nicely, I think. Um, and these are both examples of a Caribbean category, a idempotent complete additive category, enriched in finite dimensional vector spaces. Um, and most of the examples I know of Krull-Schmidt categories are somehow pretty close to this example. You know, you might, for example, have um, enriched in finite dimensional modules over a local ring or something like that, but they're, they're rather close to this example. So I just want to kind of give an alternative potential history of the subject of ICs. So I want to consider the following category. Since, since I consider all algebraic varieties and proper maps between them. Um, and we consider this class of sheaves sigma q, which is, uh, which contains the constant sheaf on X for X smooth. Um, and if, Is in our map in is, is is in our class of maps. So I is proper, and um, F on X is in our class of sheaves. Then uh, then it's push forward. Also is in our class. And C, um, our class is closed under isomorphism, direct sum ends. And shift. So I don't really have a feeling for, um, for these things, but if I didn't know the decomposition theorem and you 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 told me this class of sheaves, I would just imagine that it's kind of enormous. So you have this whole zoo of maps and um, and you have all of these subtle. So if if you think about, for example, a constant sheaf here and some map down here, then this this is measuring the way that the fibers move in the sense of algebraic topology and. Um, I, I don't know, I, do, I would just guess that this, this, this family is totally enormous, but what the decomposition theorem tells us is that um, this family is essentially the, so the decomposition theorem tells us that this family is, consists of direct sum, consists of complexes isomorphic to direct sums of shifts of IC sheets um, of geometric origin. So I find it interesting to, oh, I should have said, um, yeah, sorry, I'm, so Hélène said, what do you mean by sheaves? Um, in the discussion of the Vey conjectures, a, a sheaf actually meant something concentrated in degree zero, but now I'm, I mean sheaves in the sense of complexes. So complexes of sheaves. And also an, another important thing that I should have emphasized is that DBC of X, Q is Krull Schmidt. So 
So it kind of some ends. Makes sense. I mean, I'm in this Krull Schmidt world, so it, re it really makes sense to decompose something into its sum ends and say these are the sum ends of, of, of some direct image or something like that. Okay. Um, so I'm not advocating this as a kind of desirable alter alternate history, but um, if we kind of taken this Krull Schmidt point of view seriously and looked for the sum ends of direct images, um, what does, so Elena asked, what is the smallest class of sheaves? So, well, let's say that, um, so I'll define a class of sheaves. So I take constant sheaves on things that are smooth. I push, push them forward under all potential proper maps. Um, and I take shifts and some ends of what I get. Okay, and that's my class. And, act, and this class of sheaves is the same thing as if I allow myself now to repeat this process. Okay, so if I would just, um, in the 70s, if I'd taken derived category seriously and started looking for these sum ends, I could have discovered IC sheaves without knowing about perverse sheaves, et cetera. Okay, so, and this um, raises, I think, the very um, natural question of what happens when we take mod P coefficients. So we can consider sigma of k for any field. Namely, we take the um, constant sheaf on any smooth variety, push it forward and look for some ends and repeat. What do the objects look like? And what we would like to say is that for all proper maps, this direct image splits as a direct sum of blah, 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 blah. And we should fill in this. And now um, I'm going to, um, this, so this is the kind of um, parity sheaves idea. So if we restrict, so I'm not going to say this theorem very precisely. I just want to give you an example of a, a, a sense of what the theorem says. If we restrict to a class of stratified maps um, where all strata and fibers um, satisfy parity vanishing. I the odd cohomology odd cohomology of a fiber with coefficients in there. Then um, then all direct sum ends are classified by, by strata. So more precisely, so in this um, in this world, I'm now um, fixing 
uh, stratifications of all my spaces involved, and I'm only allowing maps which are um, which are topologically locally trivial with respect to that stratification. So probably a good example to think about is just consider the world of all toric varieties and toric morphisms between them. Um, this is an example. Be, be, essentially, equivariance forces um, the toric stratification, it, all my maps to be stratified by the toric stratification. Um, so in this, in this setup, for every stratum in any space in my class of objects, there is a unique indecomposable complex, E of x lambda, such that E of x lambda occurs in, as a direct sum some and inside any resolution of x lambda bar. So that's the first statement. So this splits off from any resolution. And the second statement is that all some ands, all some ands are of this form. So I might um, consider some situation where I might have a um, some map down to here, and then uh, so so I'm I'll the theorem tells me that um, on the open locus something splits off, which which I in some sense already know about, and then the second part of this theorem is saying that um, any stuff that splits off on lower strata can also be obtained as a resolution of that stratum. So that, that's the theory of parity sheaves. And so just examples where, so this is a very restrictive setup, um, but examples where the theory applies are toric varieties and all toric morphisms. Um, the kind of the world of Schubert varieties and bot samuelson resolutions. And also nilpotent cones. And you'll notice that in each of these cases, there's a kind of strong equivariance. So here we have a torus equivariance, here we're asking for a Borel equivariance, and here we're asking for equivariance under some reductive group. Um, and um, these parity sheaves, when we first started playing with them, they kind of seemed like just enjoyable things for our little corner of the universe. Um, but I'm kind of more and more convinced that they're really fundamental objects. Um, so for example, some of our deepest knowledge of, of characters in modular representation theory, for example, um, if you ask a question like, what are the simple representations of um, symmetric groups in characteristic P or algebraic groups in characteristic P, um, these are incredibly hard questions that we don't know the answer to, but some of the best answers that we do know are via these parity sheets. So they seem like a very powerful tool in modular representation theory. Um, okay, so now I can get to the theorem. So basically what I want to, what the theorem is saying is that in this parity sheaf world, you have two statements. The first statement is that a parity sheaf splits off um, any resolution. And the second statement is that stuff occurring on deeper strata are also parity sheaves. And this theorem that I'm just about to state is the, is the first part of that in the context of any map. So we consider U in X open and smooth. We consider permutation local systems. So what this says is that these, these occur as a sum and coming from a finite cover. So we're fixing U in X open and smooth, and we're considering permutation representations, sorry, permutation, um, permutation local systems. So this just means sum and of a finite resolution. Um, so there exists a con constructible complex of sheaves uniquely characterized up to isomorphism by the following condition. So 
if our local system were trivial, all I would have to say is it splits off any resolution of X. But because I'm considering local systems now, I have to say a little bit more. So for any alteration, so here's my alteration of X. So this just means um, generically finite. Um, yeah, generically finite. Um, and the for any alteration, <laughs> sorry? Sorry, generically finite and the domain is, is smooth, right? Uh, but yeah. Ah, yes, sorry. And this is, yeah, and smooth. The following happens. So we have that this, Geometric extension is a sum end of F lower star K X tilde shifted such so as to be self dual. If and only if a much easier criterion happens, namely um, L shifted by the U to a or L U. Of F prime lower star K U to a. So let's just say D is the U. So all the dimensions of in this space, all the dimensions over here are the same. So So basically, if, if I consider an alteration here and I look on the open locus and my local system shows up as a sum end, then my geometric extension shows up as, as a sum end. Okay. And I think that this is probably the, you know, once we take local systems into account, this is the easiest thing that we could hope for. So this is what we call a geometric extension. Um, if, so this is a, essentially a very easy exercise. Um, if X is smooth, then the geometric extension is the constant sheaf. Um, by the, de the decomposition theorem implies that um, if K is Q, then the geometric extension is just the intersection cohomology complex. Okay. So let me... Um, So the, the theorem is very fresh out of the oven. Um, so I'm not sure what the true utility of it is. Um, I'm excited about it. Um, uh, Jordi, so uh, yes? Jordi, can I ask a question here on your statement? Can you scroll back? Thank you. Uh, if you have a, so you allow alteration, assume X is even smooth and take, um, a P et al cover, finite et al cover, and coefficients FP. Mm -hmm. Why would FP split in, uh, in the direct sum of, uh, I mean, it's not. So it doesn't, um, so we still have to check the splitting on the, on the open bit. Ah, you say it, it does split if and only, okay, I understood. Yeah, I, I apologize for the interruption. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so the, the, for me, the absolutely kind of crucial question here is what about the sum ends on deeper strata? Um, you know, what can we say about them? Um, seems extremely interesting to me and I don't know. Um, but one very nice thing is that if our resolution is semi-small, then we can show that all sum ends are geometric extensions. Um, so this is work in progress. Um, I've kind of recently become very interested in kind of in taking cheese with coefficients in a general um, ring spectrum. Um, and it seems that the argument is very soft and all that we need is this cruel Schmidt category. We seem to need crucially that E satisfies the Kunit formula and we need that E has fundamental classes. So for example, in completions of K theory or something like that, or Morava K theories, it should work. 
Um, one thing that's very exciting for me is that um, it allows the kind of local study of parity sheets. And by that, I mean that um, often um, when I'm working in with, for example, Schubert varieties, I might try to look at a neighborhood of, of a singularity and make an argument, but all of the parity sheets theory breaks when I do that. And the geometric extension theory should allow me to do that. Um, and the other thing that I find rather interesting, so I have no idea about, I remember Misha Finkelberg asked me a long time ago, um, what techniques do you have to show that some variety doesn't admit a semi-small resolution or a small resolution? Um, and I remember just thinking it's crazy that like very basic examples, I cannot show that a, that a semi-small resolution or a small resolution doesn't exist, which is, I haven't thought seriously about the problem and it's probably just because I don't know enough algebraic geometry, but I just want to provide a, like a nice little example of this. Um, so I have no idea if people can do this in some easy other way, but um, this is a simple example, but it should be an example which is rather general. So, you know, I'd, I don't want you, if you can do this example easily, I don't want you to think that this is kind of the only example that this um, theory can cover. So consider CM mod plus or minus one. Um, the claim is that for any resolution of this, the fiber over zero is of dimension. So basically the, the fiber over zero contains a divisor. Uh, so what's the argument? So the total space of O of minus two provides a resolution. Um, one can check that this is indecomposable this um, direct image sheet, and hence it must be the geometric extension. And so that tells you that any resolution has to produce at least this. So it has to be at least as big as, um, at least as big as this resolution in some sense, okay? Um, and there's many other examples of this type coming out of um, geometric representation theory. So, uh, um, potentially, this is a very useful tool to show the non-existence of certain resolutions. Um, idea of proof, I can give you an idea of proof if you're interested. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'll just wait for questions now. Eric, could you uh, give an idea of the proof, please? So the proof is just very simple, very beautiful. Um, I can literally explain the proof on one, one slide. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I should have emphasized that this is joint with my student, Chris Hone, who is in the audience. Um, so let let's just consider the case of a trivial local system, which already captures the point. So we have these two resolutions and what we want to say is that they have a com common indecomposable sum end, um, which is, they have a common indecomposable sum end, which is supported on the open locus. That's what we need to show. And by Krull-Schmidt considerations, it's enough to find maps in each direction which are non-zero on the open locus. Um, basically, because imagine that I consider a sum and over here, um, which is supported on the open locus, and then I go across and back. So this map, because this is indecomposable and I'm in an accrual Schmidt category, it's either an isomorphism or it's nilpotent. So, but it can't be nilpotent because if I look at a stalk going around here, it's multiplication by some um, non-zero element of my field. So what that tells me is that this is an isomorphism. So that tells me that this thing occurs as a sum and over here. So it's enough to find these maps. How the hell do we go about finding these maps? So there's this beautiful argument that I learned from Ginsburg's um, from G Ginsburg many, many years ago, 
and that we use heavily in geometric representation theory, which is that um, we can, so this is an algebraic question, it's, well, so some kind of chief theoretic question. What are the homs between a direct image here and a direct image here? And basically you just do about four adjunctions in a row and apply the proper base change theorem. And what you get is that this is the Borel-Moore homology or the so-called homology with closed supports of the Steinberg variety. And now, um, and that this is compatible with restriction. So we could also look at HOM from um, S star KX restricted to some open And this is also some Steinberg variety in here. And this is the restriction. And this is the restriction map on borel Moore. So here we have some Steinberg inside here. Now, the key thing is basically that, um, that um, alpha and beta are given by um, algebra by fundamental classes of algebraic cycles. So there's, I, I think I know basically nothing about this map um, so that I don't have any hope to, for example, to show that it's surjective, but it's like very rarely surjective. Um, but in the particular degree that I care about, um, to produce these alpha and beta, these are actually an algebraic so I, I, Like in this particular example, this is irreducible um, and it's just given by the fundamental class. And so now I can just take the closure of this fundamental class inside here. Um, sorry, take the closure of this thing, take its fundamental class. This gives me some object in here which restricts well and I'm done. So the, the idea is a proof is, is, sorry? I'm going to ask another question, so go on. I mean, just if, if you want to be able to recreate the proof for yourself, just think Steinberg and algebraic cycles. <laughs> right, so I was going to say, uh, so the idea is, well, one could think of this as a version of intersection homology complex with FP coefficients. And uh, yeah, so this is a vague question, but. Could there be a definition somewhat parallel to the definition of intersection homology, or doesn't seem that? Um, one of the things is that, like in this example that we saw on the previous slide, um, these things can be um, very, very non-perverse. So they can be very large. Um, and I think a, a very important question um, is to give some kind of um, local description of how to construct these things without using resolutions. Um, but I don't think we know. In the world of parity sheaves, we know how to do that, um, but I don't know how to do it here. So I don't, have a con I don't have a construction of the geometric extension that lives purely on X. Uh, maybe just a comment on that note. Um, I think you could probably think of perverse sheaves and like IC sheaves as like genuinely about constructible objects. Like we use the T structure, we use the they're an abelian category. It's like we really do use the fact that we have sheaves, whereas this is a completely formal thing. Even the like cycle maps are secretly just duality in our formalism. So it's really just a six functors formalism plus Kunith plus finiteness. We do not care what our coefficients are at all. Basically, that's why it's also works for um, more general cohomology theories. Okay. Any uh, any any other questions? 
Yeah, what prevents you of doing the same construction in positive artistic not equal to P? Uh, nothing. So I think um, it just works. Um, the other kind of exciting thing I think that we haven't really written down properly yet or written down at all is um, it doesn't seem to need... So my, my understanding of the alteration theory is, of de Jong's alterations is very limited, but I understand that like given an L, I can avoid... So the only kind of character, the only characteristics I can't avoid is P in my in the alterations theory. I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, but anyway, in, in, yeah. What what do you mean? The only what what do you so mean? So can I find so imagine that I have a something in characteristic P. Um, can I find Wait. an alteration um, that avoids characteristic L that that avoids L in its um, size? I think yeah, you're right that that is. Now we are con confused because FP was so your coefficients is called FP in your lecture. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. So Let, we, are, let's say we, are look, we are going to look at characteristic not equal to P, otherwise we do nonsense. So let's say characteristic L. It's a bit strange, but uh, and now now. <laughs> <laughs> now I apologize for that, but the theorem of Gaber is that indeed you can avoid one, uh, if you fix one L prime, for example, P, then uh, you can avoid, uh, there is an alteration which does this, but uh, your statement is not that you choose an alteration, your statement is that you are given an alteration. Yes, yeah, so I think that, um... If, if that, so I'm very happy to hear that statement's true. Um, and then the the only issue that I had was existence. And, but I think that the statement that you just made gives me the existence. Yeah, so, so, so now it's really confusing because but that's your fault. I mean, not your fault, but because your coefficient is called FP, so we have to make some gymnastic here. But we are in characteristic L. And then Gaber tells us that there is an alteration of degree prime to a given L prime, which is not L. Fantastic. So for example, prime to P. <laughs> it looks strange to say that, but uh, prime to P given your definition of P. Yeah. But on the other hand, your theorem is you give yourself an alteration. So, uh, any alteration, you don't make any restriction on the alteration here. Yeah, so I suspect um, that there should be no reason, like it should also work in the in the Atal setting. Um, and yeah, yeah given, given that GABA statement, we should also have existence. Oh, of, so that would be very nice. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you very much. Okay, A any other questions? If, if not, I want to thank Jordi again for the, for the great talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Nice okay. to see you again. Thank you. Yeah, let me stop recording. Uh, stop.